Grateful for uh, this lecture being made possible because of the generous donations to the university by the Reed Isaac family and the James Christensen family and former students of these individuals and numerous friends. Professor Edgar, we really appreciate you coming here and delivering this lecture. It's, uh, you follow uh, many people who have given these in the past seven or eight years, and we appreciate your joining that group. We have a small honorarium and also a plaque that I'd like to present to you. Okay. And just hold it like this while we're with each other. Good luck in everything. Thank you very much. Did you get the picture? Okay, with that, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Professor Tom Edgar. He's a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, he's coming up on 50 years there right now. He's, uh, he started- Where's my cane? <laughs> And uh, he, he got his um, degree in chemical engineering from the University of Kansas and a PhD from Princeton University. He uh, concentrated his academic work in process modeling, control, and optimization. He's authored 500 articles and book chapters. And I just want to say as a process control instructor here at BYU, uh, we've used his process control book. Uh, it's, it's heavily influenced the way I've taught. In fact, when I was here as an undergraduate student, I was thinking about what I wanted to do in, in my career, and I thought, I really enjoy this process control class that I've uh, been taking from Professor Fletcher, who's here with us as well, and I, I opened up the textbook that we were using, and one of the authors was uh, Tom Edgar. And I said, well, I think I wanna study process control for a PhD, so out of the blue, I called him up on the phone, and I said, hey, Professor Edgar, I'd like to come study with you at UT Austin. And he said, I don't know who you are, but uh, send me your resume. And so I sent him my resume and ended up going down and working with him and had a fantastic time uh, working with him as a, a PhD student. So um, with that, I'd like to just um, also mention a, a couple other things about Tom Edgar. He was the 1997 president of AICHE. He's a co-founder of Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition and was the previous director of the UT Energy Institute. And he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome Tom Edgar. Okay, well, thank you, John. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, it actually, his telling the story reminds me that actually when I was a graduate, an undergraduate student as a senior in chemical engineering at the University of Kansas, looking around at graduate schools, and at that point, uh, numerical analysis was just coming into play. I mean, we had a university computer that was maybe about, it would fit in the, the uh, size of a third of this room, okay? And so I learned how to do computer programming as uh, uh, part of uh, one of the classes I took in chemical engineering. I said, well, maybe this is the area I'd like to go into. And at that time, there was only like one book out there uh, on digital computation for chemical engineering written by a guy named Leon Lapidus. So I said, okay, well, he's at Princeton University, so maybe sh I should go there for my graduate study. And that's, in fact, what I ended up doing. I went and visited and said, okay, this is where I want to go. So it's like, you know, I guess history repeats itself, right? Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is, is to some extent colored by uh, my, probably for the last, well, actually going back even to the, the uh, time of the first Arab embargo, Arab oil embargo. And if anyone remembers when that was, it was in 19, if I remember, 74, 1974. It was the time that I decided, instead of being an optimal control expert, I was going to become an energy expert on coal, okay? Because coal at that time was the answer, okay? We were importing lots of oil at that time and uh, didn't see any way of ever coming up with enough oil to sustain our economy. And so the only way we could actually deal with, and then when, when we had the air oil embargo, it wasn't clear we were going to get oil from the Middle East anymore, so we had to do something else. And so... There are these crash programs that got launched at that time on coal. Well, today I present myself as a rehabilitated coal researcher, okay? I'm not 
doing coal research anymore. And you'll see why, kind of what is happening here. So there are going to be a lot of facts and figures and graphs that I'm going to show you today. Uh, probably we'll have to go through them fairly quickly, and I apologize for that, but I'll make arrangements with John or someone else in the department to make the slides available if anyone wants to go back and study it in more detail. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, and I've also in my past taught a course called Energy Technology and Policy. I started that course at UT a number of years ago. Uh, and I, I would tell students in the very first lecture that, that, you know, technology is really important, but sometimes policy trumps technology. And I'm not saying trump for another reason, okay, but it does make a big difference. Okay, so we're going to try to go through this. I'll try to stand over here and uh, not fall off the stage here. So we'll uh, uh, try to hit some of the high points, give you some data, and show you some trends that... Uh, you know, you may or may not be aware of, and, and again, there's going to be a lot of information here. Again, too much probably we can cover in the time allotted, but I thought I would put it all down into some PowerPoint slides. So here's a general outline. We're going to, you know, give kind of a high-level overview first, and then look at a lot of the trends that are occurring, and I think some of you may, may find surprising, uh, and also talk about renewables, but not so much about the technology, but really about what, again, is happening at a sort of a macroeconomic level. Uh, you know, someone, uh, when I met with the department chair today, uh, Tom Fletcher, he uh, referred to, because of where a lot of the Kemi students go to work in Houston as BYU South. Okay, well, so I'm going to give you some examples from Texas so you can kind of see, you know, how we think about things in, in terms of power, uh, you know, operating grids and so on in Texas. And some of you are, of course, familiar probably with how it's done in Utah. So, uh, so I'll, we'll do some of that contrasting. And then finally talk about, you know, what, what I see as some of the key economic driving forces. Okay, so this is, I think, uh, again, for how the public looks at energy technology. Uh, I think it's pretty confusing to most people. And if you just kind of pick up snippets of information on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week or you hear something on the news, you're not really sure how it all fits in. There's no integrated view of this. And you don't even know, for example, uh, you know, how does economics fit into that? Or someone comes up with some big discovery, oh, this is going to be implemented and, and make a big difference in the future. And then, of course, you never hear about it again because it was just, you know, somebody's PR thing. So, so finding out what's really real. Uh, I think the confusing thing also is that, you know, people say, well, you know, this costs us so many barrels of, of, of oil. Well, what does that mean? Okay. Or what's a BTU mean? Or what, what are all these units that are floating around here and how do we make sense out of all of it? I will tell you that one of the key units that I'm going to mention here is a quadrillion BTUs, okay, which is 10 to the 15th BTUs, big number, okay. United States, if you want to remember a number, consumes and has for the last number of years, consumes roughly 100 quadrillion BTUs per year, okay. So just remember that number for later uh, thinking about it. Uh, if you want to know, I actually heard this analogy recently. What, what, is, what is a good example of one BTU? Well, it's essentially the energy contained in a match. Okay, so we'll go from there. Uh, there's a whole lot of information out there about the, in the media, and there's a lot of misinformation. Uh, I think the public doesn't know how to make sense of a lot of this stuff. Uh, and even, to be honest with you, neither do the chemical engineering students I encounter as well, because they don't, you know, maybe... Uh, learn as much about energy. They, they take these courses on heat transfer, mass transfer, or, you know, fluid flow, et cetera. But you ask them basic questions about energy, they go, huh? They don't know. So I think it's hard to really grab a hold of this until you really dig in in some detail. And I think, you know, fact-based information is not provided often, and people just want to know, well, just give me a sound bite so I can have something to go on here. And it is a political process. Two prominent examples of that are essentially what's happened with auto efficiency, <coughs> starting with the Obama administration, uh, ramping up to essentially raise the, the with the CAFE standards, the, the MPG, miles per gallon of automobiles. Now, in the current administration, they want to roll a lot of this back, but again, I won't get into a diatribe about why that's the wrong thing to do, but the point is that that's been a big issue. And of course, right now, California wants to set its own standards on auto efficiency. The U.S. says, no, we're not going to allow you to do that. Okay, now what are this going to end up? I don't know. Uh, and another area would be ethanol, okay? A lot of 
you know, farm states uh, in the Midwest. You know, the farmers figured out they could get a second source of income by, you know, growing corn or other biomass and essentially making ethanol from that. And we have lots of new regulations around how ethanol ought to be used in automobiles. So these are just, again, two prominent examples uh, that occur to me. Uh, of course, you know, you can see that, you know, it's sometimes left up to, you know, our leaders as to what we ought to do. But of course, now we have a new sheriff in town here. And, and as I said, as I said, uh, policy trumps technology, okay? And of course, you know, we could get into a California versus the U.S. The, the, the policy, here's, you know, here we have the, the army coming in. We're here to free the people of Indiana. It has nothing to do with your abundant supply of corn. Okay, so again, well now we get into a lot of the facts and figures. And again, just hopefully I won't... Uh, go through this too fast, but I hope I, you know, I can point out to you some of the key things. You know, certainly carbon dioxide is on a lot of people's minds these days and car rising emissions. You know, what, how does that fit into climate change? Is there climate change or not climate change? Are you a skeptic? Do you support it? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to really try to uh, argue that point today, except that, you know, we better be paying attention to it, I think is the, the answer to that. And, uh, and so just get, again, some general ideas about where CO2 comes from. Uh, you know, here's a pie chart over here that shows a rough distribution. So again, automobiles are a big part of this, or vehicles, trucks, and so on. But then power generation is a big one, and that's what we're going to be spending most of our time on today. But industry is also a player, too. Uh, and of course, we have, on a world level, this rising amount of carbon emissions that are, that are occurring. And as you can see, they're just going up, up, up continuing to go up, as, especially as uh, China and India and other uh, third world countries, you know, they basically say, well, we'd like to be first world like you guys, okay? And so they're all moving in the same direction. Uh, and the, the growth of the middle class and a lot of the countries that didn't have a middle class, all that's going to translate into more energy being used, more energy needing to be produced, and then basically rising carbon dioxide because, again, we're sort of stuck with fossil fuels for the time being as being you know, a main player in how we do it, especially uh, so much in the transport arena. You know, the, 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 a lot of progress is those being made in the power generation side, as you'll, as you'll hear uh, later. And of course, the other part of this is that you know, we maybe have a, a kind of a US-centric view. And that could be, you know, the world view may be different than the US view. And so we maybe get exposed to the US view a lot. But, you know, what, how do we separate those two things? Okay, well, this is, uh, you know, sort of the existing policy uh, options that are out there uh, that people talk about these days. And, of course, we almost had legislation uh, for cap, cap and trade a number of years ago. Then that failed, and it really hasn't, you know, been brought back to life again. Uh, and that's a, you know, complicated kind of economics question about, you know, how, how much are you willing to pay for, you know, basically reducing carbon dioxide emissions and companies are going to buy permits in order to, to uh, have a certain amount of emission, but they're basically paying for carbon. But then there's also the carbon tax. And actually, just recently, a new organization has sprung up uh, called the Carbon uh, Leadership uh, Coalition. Okay, And it's made up of a lot of major companies, that many of whom you're familiar with, including a lot of oil companies. It's actually being led by Ernie Moniz, who is the previous energy secretary uh, under, also an MIT professor, but uh, under, under Obama. And so that one seems to actually be taking shape now, and, and it looks like they're going to be, uh, become a major player in this whole debate around climate. Uh, but they favor carbon tax. And so a lot of companies are in favor of that idea. They want to be able to say, well, this is what it's going to cost me, okay? Whereas the top option, you don't know what's going to be because it can move around. It's based on supply and demand. It can change by a factor of five or ten, depending again on what's happening. Then finally, you know, we of course historically worried about regulation, and there are regulations written in EPA. They're trying to roll back some of them now, so those that's a, ch a changing area. There was also the Clean Power Plan that was developed in the Obama administration that basically got shut down once uh, Trump's people came into office. So. You know, where that's going to end up, and again, you know, a year from now we could be having a completely different discussion about regulations, too. Uh, this is kind of a chemical engineering viewpoint of, of uh, you know, how we might be able to start doing things about carbon emissions. It doesn't really talk about uh, 
you know, what we do uh, in power plants so much as we do in, say, industry, you know, different power cycles, fuel swapping, conversion to other sources of, of, of providing heat and so on, maybe bringing nuclear into there and so on. Uh, but one of the things we still have to worry about is this carbon dioxide. And I actually had a, a nice visit with one of the faculty members in chemical engineering this morning about the process they're using for how you re reduce CO2 emissions, which looks very really interesting. Well, the, and the, the main competitor, what, what Larry wants to do is basically uh, this uh, essentially a mean re re removal of carbon dioxide. So you basically take from a power plant, the sac gas is coming off, uh, you know, just hook on a, a separations process like we know how to do in chemical engineering. You know, you absorb the, the uh, carbon dioxide with an amine solution and then basically remove it, but then you have to regenerate that amine solution by heating it up and uh, basically uh, releasing the carbon dioxide, which you can then collect and then decide, okay, are we going to pump it underground or what we're going to do with it? So that's what that, that CO2 for transport and storage is all about. But it does require energy to do that, and they're you know, highly ir irreversible processes. And so when you do the analysis, something like this, uh, you know, with that system, you're going to be using 30% of the power plant output. So to me, that's kind of a non-starter, okay? Because what you're doing now is, you know, you've, you, you've basically taken that energy you've, you've, you brought, brought into a power plant, and now you're going to be consuming a lot of it just to do this process. So we have to have better ways of doing this. Again, hopefully other people will come up with better technology. And I'm not really here to talk about that other than just point out, uh, you know, we've got to find ways in which we can reduce just the basic emissions of carbon uh, today. And the good news is that is, we're starting to see that happening in the U.S., but again, we're still far from where we probably need to be in the future. Now, kind of enmeshed in this whole business about uh, car, you know, power plants and carbon dioxide is also the whole question about oil. And I'm not going to, again, you can see this is a long problem. You can kind of look at the different presidents there and how they answered the question. Okay, well, uh, and we're still hearing that today about, okay, we're going to get rid of all the Mideast oil. Well, sorry, that isn't going to happen. Okay, we're still going to be importing a lot of energy, but of course people will say, well, yeah, but it's not from the Middle East. It's from Mexico and Canada. Well, okay, but we're still importing. We're not energy independent. But we've come a long ways, okay, and we're heading, trending in that direction, although people these days, and actually the U.S. is now the number one producer of oil and gas in the world, uh, took over, you know, it went beyond what Saudi Arabia does. So that's certainly a good sign. But again, now there are sort of troubling signs from the Permian and other places where maybe that's going to be a short-lived thing and maybe it's going to, you know, not really be the answer either. So, uh, you know, here's again, now so I start thinking about globally, or, or this is now for the U.S. anyway, you know, how do we use energy for, for uh, 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 all, all kinds of energy? And so, and again, you notice it's been highlighted over here what the renewables, how, what role they play. And again, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, here we have geothermal, solar, wind, uh, just as part of this 11%, so it's not like gross amounts, okay, but this is just percentages of renewable. Wood is still used a whole lot, believe it or not, that's been around a long time. We have, of course, hydroelectric, it's been around for quite a while. But you can see again how it breaks down between nuclear, coal, and natural gas. So this is like the big picture, and if we want to get even more complicated, uh, you can do a Sankey diagram and map everything. And I'm not going to even try to discuss this because we don't have time to do it. But the point is that, and this was actually 2011, so it's not the most recent snapshot. I'll show you more recent, uh, some information about that. But uh, you see here, here are the imports coming in to the U.S. as of 2011. Here's 28.59 quadrillion BTUs. But then we have exports, so we're not just you know, we're bringing it in, okay, but then we're sending some out, different things. And then you have, you know, refineries on the Gulf Coast. Uh, that designed the refinery to use Saudi Arabian crude. So they're not going to change. So the point is that it's a complicated picture, obviously. And again, I can't go in and talk about the details here. You could spend 30 minutes just talking about this diagram, and we don't have time to do that. Uh, but that is a you know, published diagram from the information, Energy Information Administration. So the trend that I want you to notice, though, 
uh, is this one here. So this is now crude oil. So don't worry about natural gas and coal for the time being. Here's crude oil. You can see what happens with essentially the, the net imports. Uh, they sort of grew during the, you know, the 80s. Here was the spike, remember, Arab, Arab oil embargo right there. Then it goes down, we solve that problem, but then it comes back again. And then you see we peaked out at roughly 2,000. That would be peak oil. So here we are, again, quadrillion BTUs, about 20. But now you see we start getting this decline period because, again, of shale gas coming into play. So now, you know, some different things are happening. And so if you look at, you know, how this has changed, it went from 20 down to, to maybe, I can't read it exactly from here, about 10. So, you know, it's definitely heading the right direction that we'd like to see it head. <clears throat> so now we're going to, you know, get away from, from oil as a, you know, issue and talk mostly about power from, the, from now on. So this gives you an idea, again, trend lines of the different sources of, of fuel that we might use for making electric power, which is a big part of our economy. And so here you see oil, okay, but now it's basically, you know, becoming less favored uh, for, as, a, as a fuel for making power. Let's pick up on renewables here. You can see it started growing, you know, over this time period as a fraction. But now it's starting to, it looks like if you can see this part here toward the end, <clears throat> we're starting to see some definite increases. <clears throat> and natural gas is the blue one. They see a lot more natural gas being used now. You know, the price of natural gas since uh, 20, 2010 has gone down by a factor of two to three. It used to be $5 a million BTUs. Now it's like $2. So obviously gas has become a much more attractive fuel in the future, a lot more attractive than oil, uh, and it certainly competes with, with other things. And then let's, let's save our last look here at coal. So you can see coal was a big part of the power mix up until 2000, and now you start seeing this decline. So what's behind that? Okay, so again, bringing up some more facts and figures from EIA, uh, and again, we probably don't want to get into the, the big discussion about all the stuff happening down here but you know here it is you know what's happening with with renewables that, that are not hydroelectric and so on you can see nuclear here is pretty stable okay pretty much since 1980 and that's because we haven't built any new nuclear plants in 30 years and you might say well what happened here well it actually wasn't so much for building plants it turned out that back in the 70s nuclear plants were operating at about 50 percent capacity and now they're close to 100% capacity. So that's been where the nuclear has really become more economic, uh, at least relatively speaking. But here you see coal now, okay? So here's coal uh, in terms of uh, the, sorry, coal is the black line here. So you can kind of associate black coal, right? So, so here's, where we have brown coal in Texas. We have lignite, so I guess that confuses me a little bit. But uh, you probably have brown coal in Utah too. But in any event, here's black. Down, going down here, you can see this decline now of coal usage. And then you, here's, here's the natural gas, the, the, the brown line here. So, so that's, as you can see, rising. So again, that's kind of consistent with uh, the other things that, that I've mentioned to you. I've tried to make these graphs as current as possible, but again, things are still happening in this arena. Okay, so what about the power generation side in terms of you know, kilowatt hours and where they come from? And of course, this is gonna be tied back to the efficiency of the power plant as well, not just raw BTUs, but rather, you know, how many kilowatt hours can we produce? So you, again, you can see natural gas is continuing uh, to rise up here. Coal is starting having this decline, long-term decline. Nuclear is pretty flat and so on. Here you start to see a little bit of bi uh, solar showing up here. Wind is actually the one that we're gonna be talking about a fair amount later in the talk as you know really the next big thing so so you can see the green line here is starting to trend upwards and that's gonna that's gonna continue to go up solar is going to continue to go up and so on into the future which is pretty clear we expect price declines for wind and solar by a factor of two in the future so you know 10 years from now it's going to be a lot cheaper okay so then uh, we look at you know the mix of of you know the and again, it's good to have these kind of retrospectives between, say, 2001 and 2016. And you can kind of, again, see from the graphs here, you know, look at renewables here, okay, that, 
is, you know, the renewables are going to be going up, as you can see, from here to here. And then the natural gas is, uh, sorry, let's see, I've got to look at the, the, here, the, sorry, the, the blue is all fuels, but then blue, brown is going to be the coal this time. Well, okay, sorry about that. So here's coal, and you can see it's dropping off here. The green is actually, in this case, natural gas, even though it's not a green fuel, but okay, we'll go with that. And then uh, uh, the black, the, the last one here, you can see uh, here, it, here it is for 2016, non-existent here. So again, things are changing. Now, you might be aware of the fact, and you've probably heard this before, and you may already know this, that you know, the biggest complaint about renewables is that they're intermittent. You know, we can't always assume the wind's going to be blowing or the sun's going to be shining. So that's, that's the reason why they've been slow to be adopted, because people are un unsure about the economics and about how reliable they were and so on. And that certainly was the case, has been the case for the last, you know, say, 15 out of the last 18 years. But now in the last few years, we're starting to get a different view of this, uh, as you'll see later. So I mentioned earlier. Here we have this drop off in, in coal plants. Well, uh, this is actually intended to be, you know, showing you what's happening in the past with building plants and what's happening now in the last 20 years. So here you see, again, in this case, we're going to have, you know, black for coal, so get that back again, brown for natural gas, and then probably the, the, the wind and solar, that's green, and then yellow. And so you notice. As we go down here, we had a lot of plants built with coal, not so many with natural gas, and again, that was kind of old technology. But now all of a sudden, year 2000, we get kind of a completely different picture, right? So look at all the natural gas plants starting to come online here, okay? Uh, then we see a lot of uh, essentially wind coming into play starting around 2008. A lot of the new plants are now based on wind. Again, when I say plant, it's not really a power plant because if you go now with the, the interconnections that occur in, in typical uh, regions, uh, it's not, you might be uh, essentially having windmills someplace in West Texas, but then your power plants are, uh, you know, you're, you're sending that, that electricity over long distances to meet demand. Okay, so this should, again, just remember this picture here and kind of what's happening now. Uh, so, a lot, what, a lot of what's happening with coal is that utilities are now saying, well, these plants are getting old, they're inefficient, uh, you know, I've got to do a lot of pollution control, uh, you know, for sulfur, for mercury, uh, for particulate matter, for nitrogen, okay? Uh, and so, and that's not even saying carbon dioxide yet. So there's a whole lot of pollutants we have to deal with. So, uh, you know, utilities are now looking at this and saying, okay, we need to be out of the coal business. So that is happening on a grand scale. Uh, there's been maybe uh, uh, a few coal plants have been built in this country in the last 20 years, but not many of them. Uh, so you can see again, uh, the retirements are just building up, building up. And so coal is going away, whether we like it or not, whether Donald Trump likes it or not. So it's just going away. Now we may be exporting coal to other countries, uh, that could be happening, but it's not happening in this country. But, you know, you get rid of the coal plants and you got another problem, right? So here, here we see the good news, we shut down the coal-fired electric coal power plant in your backyard, okay? So that may not be a satisfactory answer for people to say, we're going to go big on wind turbines, and then you may not like to have a transmission line with, you know, big towers and everything else, going through your property if you own a ranch in, in Central Texas, which I do. So that's, uh, and we had to fight to keep them out of going through a river and some other things. So the point is though, it is a challenge. But this has given, given rise to, you know, thinking about, you know, how you allow people to do things with power plants. There's this one philosophy called not my backyard or NIMBY. And now these days a lot of people are, and if you heard the debates last night, uh, we have a number of candidates in the Democratic side who basically would fit into this Category here, banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Okay, so that's going to be the challenge in the future as to how we might be able to do that. Okay, well, a, a quick primer on uh, what's happening uh, on the, the power production side. And, 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 you know, here you see again some of the options. If we go back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we had things called peaking turbines uh, that provided a lot of the the uh, uh, fast response we needed. 
And so we've got a bunch of different uh, options here. The point is that as we go through these options, we can have different levels of efficiency. And so that's again playing into the carbon dioxide question because the higher efficiency power plant will roughly speaking, if you, if you say burning natural gas, and these are all pretty much you know, for natural gas these days, uh, higher efficiency means less carbon dioxide plus the other thing you have going with, with natural gas is CH4. So a lot of the energetic content is going to come from the hydrogen and not just carbon. And when you burn hydrogen, you just water. So that one is fairly innocuous. But with carbon, you know, we've got to worry about carbon dioxide. So as, as you go down this list of bullets here, uh, these are becoming successfully or successively more, more efficient. Uh, I've got a couple of diagrams. That, that sort of the base load, like I showed you earlier, the base case is going to be 30% efficient uh, with with coal and with uh, a, a traditional kind of power plant. But as we go through the other options, and I'm going to do this quickly, but just point out to you that, you know, we can have, a, of course, a, a gas turbine system by itself. That's the, kind of the, the older approach. Uh, the new approach is to say, okay, let's have a gas turbine and let's uh, basically have a heat recovery unit that basically extracts steam from the hot gases in the gas turbine. And so now we can get even up to efficiencies like 49% instead of 33%. So that's a good thing. Then, you know, we can even add to that if you have industrial development near where the plant is, you can add cogeneration. So now people can actually use that steam in a process, and that's going to increase the efficiency even more, you know, up to 70 to 80 percent. So we could do a lot if we're just intelligent about, you know, the, the power cycles we employ uh, in the future. Uh, the other thing you have to remember, though, is that, uh, again, thermodynamically, there's a lot of waste heat in a power plant. And in fact, if you're operating at one-third efficiency, that means that two-thirds of the heat is going somewhere else. Okay, it's waste heat. And so there's a lot of lost energy in the system and not much useful energy. And again, as we increase the efficiency, that will get better. Uh, we lose a little bit from transmission, but it's not really a big number. You see one quad and, uh, as opposed to 26 quads uh, that we lose just right, right waste heat. Okay, and then general trends about electricity and what's happening there. Um, you know, you can see that, that you know, we're generally uh, increasing the sales to different sectors, but what's happening since 2010, it's not shown here. You can see industrial uh, use of electricity is flattened out there uh, toward the end. That's that area there. But these were rising, but now they're starting to flatten out. Okay, so that's the change that a lot of utilities are worried about. So how are they going to make money in the future if, Everyone has put solar panels on their roofs and, you know, they're not buying power from the power company. So how is that a viable business model? And, of course, you know, we still, you know, have this big grids that we have to manage. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But it is, you know, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a major technological achievement that we actually have the system and it works successfully. And you don't ask a question when you plug in your hair dryer, is it going to come on or not, right? Whereas if you go to the Middle East or some other third world countries, you don't know what's going to happen, right? Uh, it may not come on, or it may shut down the whole hotel, which happened to me and my wife at a Greek hotel once. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, so the, the point is, and this is maybe hard to tell, but this is like percent increases over time in terms of electrical uh, electricity demand. And you can see that, again, it's trending down. It used to be really high back in the... 60s and 70s, we were growing like 8% a year, which is almost unsustainable. Uh, but now it's, it's been dropping, dropping, dropping. And now we're actually into the negative re region of, of, of essentially increases of power. So anyway, that's an interesting uh, thing for the future we have to pay attention to. Well, so here's the way things are, are lined up and, and where, people, where people are going with renewables. And I'm going to say now a little bit more about how they fit in and how they could fit in even more in the future to kind of deal with the carbon problem. So these are the different, uh, uh, it's called ISO, independent system operators. And of course, if you're sitting here in, in Utah, you know, you're here, right? And there's this WECC, Western Electric Coordinating Council, which I think is maybe headquartered in Salt Lake City. Does someone know, is that right? Okay. And then we have Texas. Texas, of course, is a country all of its own. You know, <laughs> you've heard that before. So we have our own grids, except for a little bit up here in the panhandle. And then you can see how things, the other parts of this are lined up. But you can see that, and here's California kind of doing its own thing as well. So if you look here about, you know, renewables, 
and who's leading the way. Here's, here's California, and you can see how far out they are. You know, you guys, the WCC looks pretty good, but again, uh, it's a, a variety of things. Uh, uh, it's, 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 so this WCC might be influenced by hydro a lot, because up in the north, northwest. Um, and you can see that's a really, uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna get down here to, see that that color is hydro. Sorry about all the complications here, but and you see some of that is due to wind and solar. And so you see Texas now, uh, Got to figure out where they went to, ERCOT. Okay, here we go. So it's virtually no hydro, but pretty much all wind. And then we have essentially uh, uh, California, which has put in lots of incentives in order to uh, you know, get people to switch over to renewables. And so you can see this, and it also has a fair amount of hydro that it can call upon as well. But it's also got a fair amount of wind and more solar actually. Whereas in Texas, it's more wind than solar. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, that may be why you know, some of the power companies are going bankrupt in California too, is it's trying to sustain that whole thing of incentives is, is not easy for the utilities today. But you can see also in other parts of the country, there's you know, damn little going on, okay? You can see here, southeast, 4%, and so on. And, and a lot of this has to do with states that, that uh, introduced uh, renewable portfolio standards and things like this, or did other things in order to encourage uh, renewables. Uh, so I'm not sure, I think that, that, that Utah is, does not have renewable portfolio standards, is that right? So they're not there yet. Okay, well so here's another problem, okay, where we're trying to figure out how to, how to you know, solve these, these issues, is the demand is not constant, it changes over time in a 24-hour cycle. And so you can see that, that, of course, coal and nuclear are baseload. So you can see they're fairly flat during the day, and this is actually from a, a plot from Texas. Uh, but here you see wind, and it's gonna vary again during the, the time. And then we have natural gas. So natural gas is really the swing fuel that we're gonna use in order to manage the demand. Because of course, what happens on a typical summer day is that people get up and then basically turn on their air conditioning or go to work and so on. And you can see this rise in energy consumption and power consumption. It peaks out in the mid-afternoon and then starts dropping off again. So if you look at that and say, well, okay, how do we deal with that? Well, you know, a lot of people would say, well, heck, you know, if I had a lot of solar energy, then I'm getting the most solar energy at a time uh, when uh, we're getting this peak power demand. So that could be a you know, possible answer to how we deal with that variable demand. But the point is I can't ramp up coal, I can't ramp up nuclear in order to change this meet this demand curve, but I can do natural gas. Okay, so that's a, that's a positive thing for the future. But of course the other thing, if you're in a competitive market like Texas is, where basically people bid in what uh, essentially you can, you can pay for power, if you're a power provider, that sometimes you have shortages of power, and then that drives the economics. So you can see that instead of being down around you know, five to 10 cents per kilowatt hour here, all of a sudden we have a shortage now the price is $2 per kilowatt hour. So that's the whole thing. And of course, in a competitive market, people are trying to figure out workarounds to deal with that situation. It's not a complete economic solution, but it has been, been workable uh, for the last uh, five years. And of course, one of the reasons that Texas has managed to do this and do it in an economic way is shown here. All those red lines are transmission lines. So in other words, the state actually decided to build a transmission network in Texas. So that meant that people could develop a wind project out in West Texas and find an interconnect and be able to ship the power where everyone needs it, which is not in West Texas, but rather Austin, Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, et cetera. So, so having that makes a big difference. And in fact, what happens is that that charge gets, gets added to everyone's bill. Okay, so that means that the, the, the whole cost of having transmission is averaged over all consumers Whereas if you're a private utility operating in a regulated situation, you know, you don't have that ability to essentially charge everyone in a region for that and you've got different operators and different utilities. So, so that's, that's the, the reason why it's been good to have you know, one, one you know, unified grid in Texas because they can make these kind of general decisions. And you might say, well, in a, a politically conservative state like Texas, why would they opt for wind and, and solar? Those are, you know, those are works of the devil, right? Well, no. Because the farmers say, hey, it's a business proposition, right? 
You know, I can get, you know, wind and solar and make more income. And the legislators understood that and they voted for it. So this was supported politically. Uh, although there was a little bit of complaining after the fact, like, well, why do we do all this? But, you know, it's okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna, I gotta skip through this one because we'll, we'll run out of time before I can get to some other things. The other thing that's happening out there you know, that you've heard about is, of course, shale gas. And here you see a graph of you know, how that's all developed. That's a relatively new, new development uh, uh, in the U.S. And that's, of course, making natural gas uh, look more interesting in the future. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, you know, there's a lot of production happening. You can see, again, not much shale gas back in 2005, 2006, and now it's, it's gone up by quite a bit. So that's, that's certainly great. You know, if you're in this country, you know, you've got natural resources that you can call upon. Uh, but now it's interesting to see kind of a, in a trend line from, you know, before and after how things have really changed. And this is, again, I'm going to use uh, ERCOD as the example. So here's 1999, and again, you can see here's coal, 25 to 21. That doesn't look like a big change, but I think you'll see more in a minute. Uh, these are like the old gas steam, the traditional power plants, 50% back then, and now we're down to like 14%. But then most of it is now in the combined cycle uh, or the combustion turbine area, 37%. Nuclear has actually gone down a little bit. Cogeneration went down a little bit. But see, there was no green slice here. Now renewables are up to 17%. In fact, they're up to 20% now. Okay? And you might say, well, how do you do that? Or how does that work? Well, because they you know, figured out how to deal with the dynamics of wind. Uh, some people will tell you, like, you know, one expert in the audience from NRL, Wesley Cole, is a graduate from here, will say, well, if you put more windmills out there, you actually get to average out a lot of these intermittencies. So you actually get better, better results by having more windmills instead of fewer. Okay, this is, again, another sort of tabular snapshot just to give you an idea about, uh, you know, how much uh, things could change uh, over 2007, 13, 19. And you can see, again, nuclear is dropping off. You know, wind is going way up. So here's the... Uh, 3, 10, and 20 percent, okay, and then uh, uh, gas is essentially, it looks like it's staying about the same, but, but not really, but here you see coal is now almost half of what it used to be, and it's going to continue to go down. And this, again, is just the last three years, and again, you can see the remarkable changes on wind, uh, but then also, again, just in the last three years, you know, how much coal changed, 32, 25, 20, so there's big changes there. Okay, so let me, uh, I'm going to uh, just kind of, because we need to have a few minutes for Q&A, uh, I'm going to skip this, but just point out to you that we did a study at UT at the Energy Institute where we tried to understand, well, why do the answers change all over the country about why people should do renewables or not if they're going to build a new plant? It turns out that you can actually produce maps like this that essentially help you figure out. So like, for example, and again, trying to cut through a lot of the detail here, that if you want to just compare for a given county, you know, what's the cheapest option? If it's green, that means that's all wind, that that's the preferred place to have wind. But if you're in Utah, for example, okay, you've got uh, essentially these red areas, which is going to be NGCC, natural gas. Then you've got some purple ones here, uh, which is, uh, let me find it on here. I think it's, it's the coal part. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Oop. Solar, sorry, uh, over here. But that says that, 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 you know, we should be doing you know, a lot more solar in, in Utah, potentially. You know, it's a good sunny day today, for example, right? And, and we did other plots of taking into account subsidies and so on. So, so let me just say that, you know, recently some of you heard about the conference in Davos about where a lot of the, the world leaders get together and people in the business area and so on. And so here are a number of takeaways that I think you need to be aware of. Uh, one is that, 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 you know, oil and gas for the f foreseeable future is going to stay robust and continue to, to be as, as strong as it is today. Uh, so that's not going to shut down anytime soon, but uh, it is a transition fuel. Uh, and if you look at those seven big oil companies like ExxonMobil, Shell, uh, Total, and, and BP, and so on, of course, a lot of them are European and they and by their, their home and not necessarily in the U.S. Uh, but they only, you know, they may be saying some things about, yeah, we need to, you know, do more renewables and so on. But they're only 15% of the world oil production. So don't confuse what a company says versus what's happening around the world because there are a lot of national oil companies. 
Uh, and then what's happening with coal, we're seeing a lot of things happening in the US, but they're not happening abroad necessarily, and especially in countries like China and India. So that's gonna be an issue. And here's a really uh, scary fact right here, that the average age of coal plants in Asia is 12 years. So if they're gonna do the normal 30 year thing, they got 18 more years they wanna get out of that plant. Whereas in the US, most of our coal plants are old. So it's okay to shut them down. There are a lot of announcements being made by companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, blah, 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 where they basically said, we're gonna you know, do carbon offsets and do carbon neg be carbon negative in the future. Uh, the biggest pronouncement uh, by President Trump is, well, we're gonna plant a trillion trees. Okay, well, that's a good answer but it's not the answer, okay? Uh, it's a safe answer, let's just put it that way. It still doesn't say there's you know, climate, climate change or not. Um, then finally, uh, you know, industry needs to step up and worry about emissions that they're producing as part of the, the supply chain for oil and gas production. So here's where we are today, is that you know, we're having this meeting where someone in the back is saying, well, climate summit, so what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Okay, so here are the things that we might get out of that. So I think moving in the direction of reducing carbon emissions is gonna be a good thing. Uh, and so in conclusion, basically I think that, that you know, this is gonna be driven in this country by consumer preferences, by companies, stockholders, states and cities are gonna be saying things that are maybe different from what the federal government is saying. Uh, you know, natural gas is gonna be that preferred fuel, uh, mostly due to efficiency and responsiveness. Uh, and we may be seeing, you know, 80% renewables in the future. It's possible to do that. Countries like Denmark currently operate with 80% renewables or more. So it's not like it can't be done. That's a kind of a big control problem that you have to worry about. Uh, we'll have maybe more electric vehicles. Uh, and then finally, I think that again, think about US and Europe being kind of in one group of, you know, decision makers that are gonna do one thing and what you hear about what's happening in China and into India may be totally different. Okay, with that, I thank you for your attention, and sorry I had to go so fast, but uh, we covered a lot, of, a lot of ground here, so thank you very much. All right, well, thank you to Professor Edgar. Uh, we're a little bit short on time. I think there might be a class coming in after this, so if you'd like to talk to Professor Edgar, ask a question, he'll be able to hang around for just five or 10 minutes here before we head off to lunch. There also is a technical lecture tomorrow at 11 a.m. in the Varsity Theater. You're certainly welcome to come join us for that. That's going to be energy, efficiency, smart grids, and process control. So uh, let's thank Professor Edgar one more time. Thank you.